Tēnā tātou, um, no mai ara mai ki te hui nei o te ata, um, ko te Pito Pumanua Grants Subcommittee. Welcome everybody. Um, we're going to kick off now. Please let me know if yourself um, or anybody around you needs to leave the meeting, particularly elected members, because we are barely quiet. Um, <laughs> so no bathroom breaks. If you, if you do need to use the facilities, just let me know and we'll take a brief adjournment. Uh, but aside from that, let's kick into it. Morning tea, members of the public, thank you for coming. Um, we'll be at about 10.30. Uh, we will crack through the public participation, followed by a petition handover. We will then vote to enter a public excluded session, and from there we'll have some kai, and then um, we'll crack on with the rest of the meeting. Kei tapai? Happy? Yeah. Sweet. All right, so I'd like to open us with a karakia. Um, please join me if you wish. Whakataka te au ki te ru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, kia mā ki neki neki uta, kia mā tarotara ki tai, e hi aki ana te atākura, he tio, he huka, he hauhunga, si hei mauri ora. Cha. <coughs> Sweet. So just noti noting the absence of the chair, um, Councillor Nicola Young. I'm going to be chairing this meeting. Kia ora, my name is Nico Wienera. Um, so first of all, I'd like to move the motion uh, that the committee accept the apology from Councillor Young, the apology from Deputy Mayor Foon, and also an apology from Mayor Farno, um, who can't be with us today. Um, can I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor O'Neill. Um, sweet. We're going to put that to a vote. Everyone happy with that? Great. Perfect. Sweet. I would like to declare that motion carried. Um, next of all, we're going to head to the conflict of interest. Declaration. So I now call on any Councillor Browns, I mean members, uh, who do, to declare to declare any conflicts of interest that they may have uh, on the agenda today. Anyone? No, caught it. Sweet. Um, so in that case, I'd like to confirm uh, the minutes. So I'd like to move the motion um, that the committee approve the minutes of the previous grant subcommittee, which was held on the seventh of December. Second. Thank you. Let's put that to a vote. And that has been carried successfully. Sweet. And then finally, we have items not on the agenda, uh, of which there are none. So from here, we're going to crack straight into public participation. Um, thank you, members of the public, for coming today. I would first like to recognize uh, Nicola Pauling from the organization Voice Arts um, to be speaking to the submission on the Arts and Culture Fund. Kia ora, no mai. And co. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like us to sit? Or, or yeah, uh, uh, quit. you can take the podium or sit at the table. Either is totally fine. Sit and take that mic. Sure. Yeah, of course. By all means. Just make sure the green light on. Oh, I'd also like to welcome Councillor Young, who's just joined online. To use the microphone, just press the uh, button near the center. We've got it. Yeah, there we go. I just might move it to me. To <laughs> uh, kia ora koutou. Thank you so much for allowing us a short amount of time today uh, to speak to you. Um, I just want to acknowledge the fabulous funding team over there. Thank you uh, for allowing us to be here. Um, we've had a lovely long-standing relationship with Wellington City Council, I think going back about 15 years now. We don't do this very very often, so it's really nice to have an opportunity to be here. And I'm with the team, so I'm not going to talk for very long, but just uh, a little bit of context, Voice Arts, we're quite a unique charitable trust um, that uses a unique tool of drama-based uh, intervention, applied improvisation for the cognitive, social and emotional well-being of our older population. We also do work with former refugees and new migrants, but working with older people, those in their third age is the majority of the work now. We work with between 200 and 250 older people a week in the Wellington region. 
uh, in classes that are free to attend, thanks to support from Wellington City Council and other, other wonderful funders. Um, and I just want to introduce a few of the lovely people that we have here. Um, I'm going to hand over to the lovely Sarah Netta, who's terrified right now. She's a participant in one of our classes. She's based in Strathmore. <laughs> um, and um, and uh, she kindly agreed to just come and talk about why she turns up every Tuesday morning to our Strathmore class and what why do, what do you why do you come and join our classes, Sarah Netta? What do you get from it? Okay, talo falaba. Yeah, my name is Sarah Netta. She's been introduced. Um, why I joined the group is because I'm nearly 75 years old, and I'm starting to forget things, you know things like where I put the keys and things mm -hmm. like that, I forgot. So once I heard about this program, and I also do uh, voluntary work at Strathmore Community, once I heard about, you know, I said, I'll go join this. And ever since I joined this group, I'm so happy. And I'm starting, my brain is starting to work again. It helps my cognitive development, my communication skills with the people who are, I like, you know, being with with the group every Tuesday. So everyone that comes into the community with the same problem, I recommend to them, come with me to this book. And they come with me. People with worse, you know, early dementia. And they never miss a Tuesday. They told me, thank you for bringing us here, you know, it makes a big difference. Even their children who are worried about them, every Tuesday they keep reminding. I go pick some of them up, they remind them, get ready, Tuesday, you know, Serenita come, we'll pick you up and take you there. And after, we go have coffee after, and then we talk about, they love the program. They're so happy, and you know, and I recommend it to everyone in the community. <laughs> and I keep doing that at the community that I work at. Thank you, and, yeah, and the teachers, Nicole and LJ, they're the best. You know, <laughs> <laughs> they are the best. And thank you so oh, much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Kia ora, Serenita. Uh, some of you may recognise the next person I'm going to introduce. This is the fantastic Jacqueline Coates. So, um, just before Jackie speaks, uh, voice arts doesn't exist in a physical location. We're not a bricks and mortar creative space. You can't come to us. And that's been um, our co papa from the beginning. We go to where the people are and we use existing community spaces and church halls uh, where Serenetta goes, which means that we have very low overheads. 95% of the funding we receive goes directly to the incredible team of theatre practitioners, Wellington-based theatre practitioners that we pay to come and do this work, and Jackie is one of them. And it's been our philosophy that we want really highly skilled theatre practitioners to value working, taking their skill into community. We don't want them to volunteer to do that. We want to pay them to do it so they value the work and they prioritise it. Um, and Jackie's one of 10 uh, incredible theatre practitioners that we have, and we offer her work every single week. It's not project-based. It doesn't start and finish at three after three or six months. It happens every week throughout the year. Um, Jackie, tell us, I don't know, well, something. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yes, I'm, I'm Jacqueline Coates. I work as a, um, as a freelance uh, theatre and opera director. Um, and um, as Nicola mentioned, I'm, I'm Wellington-based. Um, and while I, I do a lot of work in um, in different areas of the arts and in and, and some very um, uh, big areas of the arts, um, it is absolutely um, working with a community that um, makes makes my heart absolutely sing. So um, it is um, the joy that I get from coming every week and working with my class, seeing my class, um, spending time with them, hearing what they have to say, hearing what they're concerned about is the things that keep, helps keep me um, connected in my community and especially in my um, my Karori community. It's made a big difference to how I am in that um, in that space. Um, 
Uh, absolutely, um, having a having a source of income that is regular is a very important thing. <laughs> um, in the, as an arts practitioner, um, and uh, and helps me to um, to stay afloat as well. So I think um, I get value in two ways. So obviously, I get financial value from it, but more importantly for me, I get um, connection with the people that I work with, and meeting these lovely people today and hearing what they have to say. So hopefully, that's enough. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Jackie. you. That's beautiful. Uh, lastly, I would like to introduce Richard. Um, Richard's relatively new to voice arts and a new program that we started last year called Cog Creative, and is especially for people who are living with a journey of dementia and they are out in the community and needing places to go where they feel supported, connected, but can engage in meaningful activity, an activity that is cognitively stimulating, creative, supports their use of voice and body. Richard, you're gonna, you're gonna be with me in an hour or so on our Wednesday morning class. <laughs> He's woken up early and made, and made your way all the way here. Yes. What is it about these classes? Well, you, you... every second Wednesday, we have um, a class with voice hearts. I, <coughs> every second Wednesday, we have a class with voice hearts. And I have to say, I really, really look forward to it. It's so good because what happens is, first of all, we do a few exercises to actually get the brain working, and that's, that's very good. But there's a group of us, about 10 of us, and we're socializing, we're meeting with each other as well. So that's, that's very, a very useful part of the whole exercise. But uh, we, uh, yes, we meet and we, we, we have fun. We have games, we, we have verbal games, mm -hmm. and I won't describe yeah. them all, yeah. but it really switches you on and makes you think and communicate and the people that you're meeting I've made some good friends <laughs> and so that's really valuable for me yeah, and just want to acknowledge um, that you know over the uh, over the last few years in particular, we've built lovely relationships with Dementia Wellington, um, Alzheimer's New Zealand, uh, and uh, and local GPs and health improvement practitioners. We get a lot of referrals into our classes now, which is really exciting. So Voice Arts is really sort of sitting at this crossroads of sort of art and psychoeducation and health. Um, and it's a really interesting um, and wonderful space to be working in. And just want to acknowledge our gratitude for. Um, Wellington City Council support. Thank you. One minute, 33 seconds. Got it. Thank you. Well, if, if you like, um, we can use that one minute, 30 <laughs> seconds for any questions from <laughs> members. Are there any? No, thank you very much. Beautiful. Thank Good. you very much. Lovely. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, oh, where's the one from Council Brown? So I have, I'm always interested in the administrative structures. So ha, ha, are you the sort of sole practitioner in terms of running the show or do you have a team around you to help with the admin? Yeah, so we're a charitable trust. So we have a, a board of governors. Um, I'm the main person, yeah, but we also have someone that does sort of um, all the financial stuff, the bookkeeping and the uh, accounts and make sure that we're transparent. But yeah, I do um, a lot of the, <laughs> I do the facilitating and I do a lot of the grunt work as well. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank Wonderful. you very much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for coming. Thank All right, then. Um, could we please hear from Lily Woodbury uh, from the Depression Recovery Trust? Oh. Roger. Welcome. It's working. Hello, Mike. Hi. Um, kia ora koutou, councillors, um, officials. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, my name is Brent Williams and I'm the voluntary director of the Depression Recovery Trust. Um, Lily kindly arranged the meeting. Um, I'd like to quickly summarize the, what we're doing, and I'm sure there'll be some questions arising out of it, so I want to leave plenty of question time. It's a big concept, it's new, and um, I would welcome your questions. So this comes out of my own lived experience. Um, it comes out of Heiara Oranga, which was the inspirational opportunity which invited hundreds, thousands of people around the country to say what they wanted in terms of a transformative new mental health service. Um, 
So it's the combination of those two big events, really. And, and what is the need? What is, the, what, what is out there that we're stepping into? It's, it's still a crisis, basically, in mental health. Um, despite the $1.9 billion, we've seen very little um, change on the ground. Counselors are still absolutely stretched, waiting lists. There's no new mental health services really that are significant in the Wellington region for the missing middle. Um, there's plans afoot to increase um, facilities at the acute end, and there's been good moves in the mild end with, with health imp improvement practitioners, et cetera. But you know, we're looking at people who need more than a couple of 20 minute sessions and, and a breathing exercise and a few tips to take home. We're looking at people who are really suffering in that middle section, moderate levels of common mental illnesses, depression, anxiety, PTSD, personality disorders, who literally have got nowhere to go when they step out of the GP office or the HIPS office until their next visit. And in today's society, unfortunately, even arriving in an ambulance at the A&E does not guarantee you a bed or a service in our um, mental health facility today. It is that chronic. So we're stepping into the space for the moderate, um, people are suffering moderate levels of mental distress. What are we doing? We're building a good old fashioned centre, a physical place uh, where people will come to. It's in the third floor of the James Smiths building. It's about two thirds of the fit out has been completed and it's gonna be a wonderful, beautiful, inspirational space where people come to and be part of a community of 30 or 40 people at any one time where they're surrounded by a collaborative team of mental health practitioners, psychiatrist, GP, nurse, OT, social worker, bunch of therapists, art therapists, and some very skilled um, tutors. People like Arts Trust, who I'd love to talk to after this meeting, who I didn't even know existed, to come and inspire people, heal them, treat them, support them, take them on a journey um, of about four to eight weeks during the day, so nine to five, they go home every night in the weekends, which is deliberate. So we're not a residential place. We're not somewhere tucked away in a beautiful spot where we help people and then have to throw them back into the community. So it's very much about an integrated, uh, integrated service, integrating people with services and integrating people with their home lives and their therapies and treatments. Um, on either side of this program, there's gonna be a a comprehensive pre-program where people will be assessed, treated, supported, stabilised and prepared for the program, which could take um, four to six weeks. And then when they graduate from the program, they will continue to be engaged. We'll provide weekly support groups, peer support groups, workshops, psychoeducation classes for people, opportunities to volunteer, come back into the centre and, and buddy up with somebody who's just starting, which I know from my own experience is a very helpful part of my own recovery. Um, where have we got to now? Was well, as I said, two thirds of the, of the build is completed. We're starting to engage our first paid staff, an administrator and a practice manager. We're looking for therapists and professional staff, and we're getting some 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 really strong interest from people who want to work in this new integrated model. Um, Sadly, people are leaving the DHB, or whatever it's called now, in droves. Six, six, six psychiatrists have left in the last six months in this region, and you know, we have to do things differently. We can't just keep doing the same old, same old, and we are doing something which, is, which is, looks innovative, but it actually it's not. It's what's been done in, 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 in solid countries around the other countries who put money into this thing for, for decades. In Germany, for example, there are 600 of these centres that treat 25,000 people at any one time. They've been operating for decades. Um, if we had that model here, we'd have about 30 in, throughout the country treating several thousand people at, at any one time. So um, we have raised, we have, not, we have tried to uh, interest, interest government in this model, but it's just too hard. There's just too much transformation um, and is the government right to be building a community-based service anyway? And perhaps not, and that's where we've stepped in. We've raised about $700,000 from the community um, and additional service from wonderfully generous companies, pro bono professionals, 
throughout the, the, you know, the consultant field, Chapman Trip, Deloitte, Victoria University, AUT. I mean, there's just a pile of people who are contributing to this. And why? Because they all know somebody in their whanau or their colleague, their work, workplace or somebody who has been affected by mental illness and they know the gap and they know there's nothing there. So, but we need more to get up and running. We can't quite open yet. We're looking for a $300,000 to finish our establishment budget. And we've just had a wonderful offer from a very generous donor in Wellington who says, here's a challenge to you, Brent. He said, if you can raise $150,000, I will match it dollar for dollar and you'll reach your $300,000. So we're here looking for $150,000, and anything that the council can contribute to this will be a great help to our to our efforts. We hope to open in September, if we can if we can get that money together. Look forward to your questions. Wonderful, thank you very much. I have one question from Councillor Young and the others, and one from Councillor Brown. Kia ora, um, Councillor Young. Um, so thank you. Apologies for late start. I had trouble logging in. So I'm just wondering, so the money you're asking for is towards the establishment of your um, new quarters, um, but what about the running costs? It's more than just the quarters. It's to, it's, to pay for, it's to pay staff that we're having to employ now to set up the program, make it operational, onboard staff, train them, do, do all that stuff. I mean, with a mental health service, there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff to make it safe and, and ready for action. Um, it's not just going in bricks and mortar. That's been actually very light because we've had so much help and, and we've got a very generous landlord and we've had very generous firms contributing. Um, we also need it to, um, to prepare and assess our first cohort of um, participants. But we're not looking to raise money for ongoing, ongoing costs. This will be met by funders, ACC, private insurance companies, local iwi, and hopefully in time to Fatu Ora. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Councillor Brent. Yeah, thank you. Brent, um, I, I guess that I looked at you know, what the council is, is or what the officers are recommending, and it seemed, you know, it seems like it was half what you asked for. Um, but it, it, do you feel like the council has actually engaged with your project to the extent that you would have liked? I mean, you know, our, our kind of role in this is a governance one to make sure that the council officers are, are, are doing the job which they're meant to do. Um, I mean, I'm sure you're not going to criticise them, but it, it does feel to me that, that we perhaps haven't um, em embraced what you're trying to do as much as we could have. I think that's partly our fault, to be honest. Um, how do you engage with the council when you're so busy and there were so few of us and we're just doing so many tasks? I think every time we have engaged, it's been a really good reception, but we have to now fit into quite defined... Um, funding streams, but I think this is a great opportunity for council to say this is a new initiative, it's a one-off situation. We won't be back next year asking for, to get us off the ground. We'll either be here or we won't. <laughs> we, we will be here. So now is the time to say perhaps they, you could look a little bit wider and say, look, you know, give us the 24 and that will be doubled. That'll become 50 mm. and that will be a wonderful start to what we're doing. Kia ora, thank you for that. And one final question, uh, Hepato Ta O'Neill. Kia ora Brent, nice to see you again. Um, so you've requested 24,000 and we've given you 12,000. What will that 12,000 be able to do as the um, wage support for project management? Um, if we're just giving you half, what does that look like for that remaining amount of money? We will work hard to raise it elsewhere, but it will pay for our practice manager to set up the systems and make the program operational, which is it's our, our, our most important employee at the moment. Kia ora. Wonderful. Thank you very much for your submission. Um, it was much appreciated. Nā mihi Thank you. Okay, I'd now like to welcome Andrew Mitchell from Vincent's Art Workshop um, to support their submission on multi-year funding social and rec fund. And I understand there is a accompanying slideshow, so councillors, could you please draw your attention? Could I please draw your attention to the screen? Welcome. You also have 10 minutes. Um, if you would like to leave any time for questions, please um, just leave a couple of minutes at the end. Otherwise, haere tonu. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. 
Um, ko Andrew Mitchell tōku ingoa, um, kei te kaiwhakahaerea hau um, ki, ki te whare mahi toi. Um, nō reira, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, I've got with me our, um, dep the Deputy Chair of our organisation, uh, Susan Gordon. Uh, For 37 years, Vincent's Art Workshop Te Whare Mahi Toi has been changing Wellingtonians' lives through art. We are a vibrant community art space in Water Street Village. Vincent's operates a philosophy of inclusion. All people are welcome of any age, ability, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation and gender identity. But our service is particularly targeted to people with mental health needs and disability. People using our service are, are called our artists. We help, help our artists integrate within society. We offer a stable, safe community hub. Our studio is made up of the main studio, pottery room, uh, a gallery and a tour workshop. Our skilled professional art tutors support our artists to create a program of work and express themselves creatively. We hold regular workshops on a wide variety of topics, such as um, ceramics and fiber crafts, painting, sculpture. Artists display and sell their work at monthly exhibitions in our gallery. This helps our artists develop a sense of self and pride. Vincent's partners with organizations such as the Downtown Community Ministry, Council Housing and Boarding Houses which a lot of our artists have connections to these places. For 15 years, we've taught weekly um, art outreach, art outreach um, sessions at Te Whareo Maitairangi, uh, the mental health ward at Wellington Hospital. Um, on release, many, many of these patients have actually come and attended our space. Uh, I've, I have been, re I've recently accepted the permanent role of coordinator. I've been with Vincent's for over 17 years uh, and I'm excited to lead us into this new phase of our journey. Um, with the support of our patrons, Dame Susan Snively and Howard Fancy and our dedicated committee. Vincent's has a new year plan, which is just being developed. It focuses on three goals, inclusivity, accessibility and sustainability. Inclusivity, for example, will strengthen our connections and programs for diverse populations with specific e efforts on Māori in Year 1, the neurodiverse in Year 2 and youth in Year 3. For accessibility, for example, we will conduct an audit uh, of barriers to participation for those people with physical or other disabilities. And sustainability, for example, we will develop a sustainable business model with funding certainty and already we have improved financial management. We thank Wellington City Council thoroughly for their valuable financial support for which is over 27 years now I believe. Vincent's has multiple synergies with Wellington City Council's strategic goals. Um, including strengthening social connections, an innovative, inclusive and creative city, and increasing arts access for diverse communities. Wellington City Council is a crucial partner for Vincent's with grant funding providing 28% of our funding over, over the past four years since we extended our opening hours after the city library closed at the, at the request of the council. Uh, wages are our biggest expense at 74%. So we've, we've modelled the impact of, of different levels of, of council, uh, multi-year council funding, 60,000, 100,000 and 150,000. The average, average level of funding that um, we have had from the council uh, from over the past four years for the multi-year funding has been 107,000. And we're aware that council officials have recommended to you that Vincent's received 90,000 for one year until June 2024. At, at 90,000, we would need to look at 
reducing some of our, of our services, um, re including opening hours, the tutor hours and tutored workshops. Uh, if, if the council provides funding of 100,000, in our scenario, this is traffic light orange. Um, this is similar to our current state, so we'd be open for 36 hours per week. Um, we provide 86 hours of tutoring per week and have 100, approximately 650 visits from our artists per month. If the council reduces our funding, um, if it was just 60,000, this is traffic light red and we would need to scale down services. Uh, this would be a combination of reducing the number of hours um, and tutor contact time. Uh, it, this could cause considerable distress in our artist community. Vincent's really is a home for the people who come to us. If the council increases funding to 150,000, um, which is what we um, did apply for in our application, um, this would be our traffic light green. This is really what we want to work towards. This is growth for us. We would extend our opening hours, um, provide more like 116 hours of tutoring time per week and have approximately 800 artists visits per month. And this is what the artists have been asking for. For Vincent's to be inclusive and accessible for all, we, we need sustainable council funding. For instance, to be a safe, welcoming place for our artists, many of whom who have no fixed abode and are from diverse communities, we need sustainable council funding. 150,000 per year would be our, our optimal amount. This would allow us to be responsive with more programs for homeless and those in temporary housing. We would be present at more community events and we would have longer opening hours, more tutors on hand and a a greater capacity for the artists. The importance of Vincent's can be summed up in this quote from one of our whānau. The last couple of days I had away, sometimes it can be overwhelming. Then I could subconsciously and telepathically hear my friends at Vincent's say, where's Ash? So I got up and went in and was reminded I'm definitely in the best place I've been for a while. Thanks for providing us the opportunity to speak today. Tēnā koutou katoa. Um, do we have any questions from members? All right, thank you very much for your submission. Cool. Kia ora. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Um, Sweet. Um, the committee would like to hear Rowena Tun, Erin Gribble from Wellington Time Bank um, for their submission on multi-year funding sock and rack fund. No my my welcome. Once again, you have 10 minutes. If you would like to leave some time for questions, please do so with a couple of minutes at the end. Proceed when you're ready. Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, so my name is Erin uh, and I'm here today on behalf of the Wellington Time Bank uh, and I'm with Rory Wiener Tan, our wonderful Kaifakahaide coordinator. Um, Time Bank is a sub-organisation of the Newtown Community Centre, you might know me from there, uh, and we provide management support, um, some financial uh, support, free office space, free venue hire and other things. Uh, there is a steering committee, which is a non-legal governance group. Uh, so what is the time bank? Just a quick recap, I could talk about that for ages, and I've got a few pictures to illustrate some of our members. Um, we're a community of people that share our skills, our knowledge, our talents for time rather than money. We're a community of 800 members, including 103 organisations, many community organisations that you'll be familiar with across 46 suburbs. There's about 30 time banks in New Zealand and we're all connected through a, a network and a lot of us like to trade into city when we can and we were really connected through COVID because everything went online. So we did all these cool online workshops and I went to one from Raglan Time Bank and, <laughs> and from Tamaki Makoto Time Bank. Uh, Consumer Magazine recently profiled us uh, on a big national thing. So yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of love for Time Bank out there in the world. 
We're here today because we just wanted to remind you about Time Bank, let you make sure you know all about Time Bank, uh, and let you know sort of like how we achieve a lot of the wider aims of this fund and specifically, um, yeah, Wellington community funding in general. We're aware that Time Bank reduces inequality, it empowers communities and members, fosters social connections, strengthens local economies, it enhances well-being and quality of life promote sustainable lifestyle, it fosters a more compassionate, inclusive and sustainable Wellington. And if I had more time, I could actually speak to each of those <laughs> points in great detail. Um, so we're here today to say thank you for the recommended funding that you have given us and you'll be pleased to know we're not actually here to ask for more money. <laughs> but rather we are here to uh, request that we could be looked at being moved from a one-year funding contract to a three. We were previously on a three-year funding uh, contract, and I guess we're just feeling a bit, a bit vulnerable that we're um, being moved to a one-year contract. We know how important our organisation is to our members and to the wider community, because the Time Bank really does serve so much more than just our members. Uh, all, uh, anyone's always welcome to any of our events, and many non-Time Bankers do turn up. And of course, as I mentioned, we support 100 and, uh, 103, 103 uh, organisations, community organisations that we know um, are stretched with resource. So the past few years have been pretty challenging for us as an organisation with COVID. A lot of people haven't wanted to get together in each other's homes and uh, in large groups. We've also had a change in our software. We were priced out of the old software and it wasn't fit for purpose. So that's a really big change for us, migrating 800 members and all those organisations over. Uh, but our members are engaged and they are coming back post-COVID, which is really exciting. And we've got a wonderful coordinator and a really, really committed steering committee. So I just quickly wanted to address a couple of uh, misconceptions about time banking so that you all really know uh, this amazing service that you're funding. And one of those myths that we've heard before is that the Wellington Time Bank is a little too focused on the Newtown area. So it is true that we have a large Newtown membership. And largely that's because we started as uh, Wellington South Time Banks and then we merged to covering the whole of Wellington. So we've always had that core in Newtown that's been really engaged. And it was a community initiative right from the get-go. So it was really a bunch of Newtowners that started it. You good? Oh, press. Oh, I, I, one stat I hadn't given you, I'd looked at the um, suburban percentages, and Newtown is highly represented, but it's like 25%, so it's um, across those 46 suburbs, it, there's quite a spread. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Rowena. Um, yeah. Also, our office is based in Newtown, so it's natural that there's, um, you know, a bit more engagement there. Uh, and Wellington is a really, really huge hour. Rowena has uh, like 30 hours a week to run an entire organisation that covers the whole of Wellington. <laughs> that's, that's a lot. But she does fantastic. And as she just mentioned, we do have a wide reach and we have members in, all, uh, in 46 suburbs. Um, we also hold events in other areas uh, and our coordinator, Rowena, has worked out of other centres a lot to increase that engagement. Recently, Mount Verk, Brooklyn, Strathmore. So, yeah. Uh, we've also heard in the past, like, oh, time banking, it sounds like volunteering. What's the difference? And volunteering is fantastic. Love volunteering. Um, but volunteering and time bank are really, really separate. So a few points on how they're separate. Reciprocity. Time bank really emphasizes the uh, re reciprocity. <laughs> the, <res bleh. laughs> the exchange of services. It's like, I need you, becomes we need each other, right? Um, there's also a broad definition of contribution. In time banking, any skill or service is considered valuable, so it doesn't really matter what that is, whether that's providing companionship, whether that's a little bit of gardening. The focus is on a diverse range of skills and the diverse abilities and interests and participants are really honoured. Um, time banking is also community building. While volunteering can definitely contribute to community building, Time Bank really places a strong emphasis on fostering those social connections and building relationships within the local community. Flexibility, Time Banking can choose when you do it, which is really cool. And uh, 
another difference is that time banking really allows for those things that um, traditional volunteering you may, might not see as much, sort of really informal services. We have some pretty incredible and unique offers out there that um, I don't know where you would get that help uh, outside of sort of the time bank. Yeah. Um, and also we support a lot of volunteer organisations. So a lot of our organisations actually pay their uh, their volunteers in time credits, which then pulls them into our community and also means that they can get their needs met. So I'll just give you a couple of fun stats. Uh, we've had... 31,500 plus hours of exchanges, which translates to 3.5 years. Uh, we've had 11,200 ex exchanges, not in hours, actual exchanges. Currently, and we've just moved software, so people are still sort of getting used to that and listing things up. Um, we have 91 offers and 67 requests listed, but this changes sometimes daily and always weekly. And this year to date, we've had uh, 154 exchanges of help and 806 hours of contribution to each other. And it has been a bit of a hard year getting started up. We've, we were understaffed for a long time before we found this gem. Um, our time bankers' ages range in nine years to 89 years old, and they come from a wide range of neurodiversity, ability, ethnicities, beliefs, genders, and identities. People who otherwise wouldn't meet get to meet through the time bank and exchange not only skills but culture, and they get a sense of belonging and meaningful contributions to each other's lives. Um, I've taken heaps of time. <laughs> I'd just like to say you get so much bang for your buck with Time Bank. It's not just the Time Bank that is served, it's the wider community. People are invited to our workshops, our public talks, our working bees, our connection events, just in the events that we run alone for the price point. It's, it's good. Um, but then there's all those other benefits for members and for member organisations. Um, Rowena, do you want to quickly just share your one quick favourite trade? Oh, that's a hard one because there's um, there's a lot of goodness. But there, I'll, I'll do two really quick ones. We do have one question from Councillor Matthews as well. But okay. please go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So um, one of the people. So well, one of the things I want to say is that that 837 people is growing every day, and when you belong to the time bank, you're always part of it, and your needs come and go. So we had someone come into. Um, set up a new uh, tool library recently and when I was talking to her she hadn't been engaged for about four years and when I was talking to her she she recalled being in a really hard place had to move flats just like that 15 people turned up to her house from the time bank she was a solo parent had um, uh, some physical limitations and and that well-being She's got four years of carrying that well-being, knowing that people will catch her. And that's really different from anything, you know, to know that there is a network of people, complete strangers, that is there to receive your call for help. And here she is giving back and, and setting up a tool library in Miramar. And the other one is an 89-year-old who rings around for age concern, has been volunteering for years, suddenly found out that they were in social housing at the bottom of Brooklyn Hill, found out that they could join the time bank and was like, oh, I'm being really stuck getting out of the house. I can't get to the supermarket easily. Put a call up, bang, like in four days, someone responded, has been taken grocery shopping every single week. And when I spoke to the person who's taking them grocery shopping, because um, they rang up and said, you, you can um, take the, the ad down, she said, oh, Actually, I was made redundant. I feel really socially isolated. We shouldn't use those words, but she said, this is meaningful um, for me. It's really helping me a lot. And um, that's the kind of impact you can have. And the wellbeing benefits from that is why the London and the UK Time Bank is heavily funded. Um, and it's not really recognised in New Zealand yet. Okay the impact that you can have. Thank you for that. I tell you what, we do actually still have one minute and 40 seconds in our time bank. So um, <laughs> um, I, I will allow that question from uh, nice. Councillor yeah. Matthews. Thank, thank you. Tēnā koro, I just wanted to um, acknowledge all the emails that we had received. Many of us, that'll be the first time we've heard of Time Bank, so, you know, to, to know that you, you, they've been read and we've seen them. And I, I guess I just wanted to quickly ask, 
what is what is the impact, if any, on your mahi of having only one year of funding rather than the three year? How does it impact what you do? It, it does create a lot of uncertainty. You know, I, I stepped into this role. I've been full time for three months. Well, you know, I think of thirty hours as full time, and I think that um, we're the second largest and strongest time bank in New Zealand. Yet we're faced with this insecurity, and I. And internationally, there's research to show the, the the time banks that are strong and have the most impact into society are the ones that have are well funded. They actually have more than just a, one coordinator, to be honest, and um, they have secure funding. And I I think that whilst I'm really passionate about um, time banking, I come with 25 years of NGO experience with a lot of skills that and you know, like, I'm grateful for the job, but I also know that they're lucky to have me. To, if you're not getting paid a high wage and you've got one year of job security, that that's not a, a strong position. That's not being well supported by the council. Mm. And, 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 and we have been well supported by the council. We're a 12-year-old organisation. Sustainability Trust has been one of our longest members and they're doing all these collaborations with us for us to say, oh yeah, we're setting up this collaboration but I don't know if I'm going to... Well, like Recently I said, oh, I don't even know after until we heard about the recommendation. We don't, I don't even know if I've got a job after a month. Now I've got a year and a month. And um, just quickly to add to that, I guess it's like we're responsible to all our members and like how do we future plan and um, especially in this time when we've got this new software and other things um, going on and re-engaging after COVID. It's like we really, yeah, um, just need to do that mahi and not be scrambling for funding which would take all of our all of our time. And yeah. it's not about my job security, I'm, it's I'm about the sorry. security of the organisation. I, I will have to uh, interrupt <laughs> you there we are going to move on but can't give you your time much. credit for another uh, another hour thank, <laughs> thank you very much time. we appreciate thank you so much for your time and for your funding thus far all right cheers um the committee would like to hear from murray from wellington city mission um submitting on their multi-year funding application no my heart of my you like me heel down there okay okay you can use the podium or the whatever you would like oh, yeah, i'll stand up shall i morena tato good morning and thank you for the opportunity to speak today um, I'm here to talk about uh, Tipa Maru, which is the um, uh, residential alcohol harm reduction service at 304 Taranaki Street. But before I do that, I want to acknowledge um, the tragedy of last week at Loafers Lodge. Um, eight days ago, we know the city suffered an enormous tragedy, um, and um, many of us, including Council, have been dealing with the aftermath of that ever since. Can I acknowledge what Council's done? Um, because you guys stood up. You stood up at a time you needed to and you continue to do so. The Mayor has been outstanding in her public um, representation of the situation and her care for the community and, and so I'm, I'm very grateful for that and I wanted to acknowledge that. The work continues. Um, you may be aware that the fund that um, we are administering on behalf of the community uh, currently sits at $290,000, uh, 50000 from Council and 240000 from the members of the public. So even in a situation of, of disaster, we see the good of the community come through. And that's so, so thank you for that, and, um, and thank you to the community for their support. And it talks about the strength of Wellington, and um, when I um, hear the other public contributors and I read the applications to this fund, it warms my heart that we've got so many people doing such amazing things in the city. Um, it makes your job inevitably way harder because you've got limited resources and you have to share it amongst those who um, are doing the work that they're doing. But isn't it extraordinary that we've got so many people out there doing such extraordinary work in the city? Um, I don't want to talk at length about uh, Tipa Maru, because most of you have heard me talk at length before about this particular topic. Uh, and a number of you got the opportunity to come and visit a few weeks back. Um, this is a project that's been a long time in the gestation, and if we think about the attempts we've had as, an organi as a city and as a community to establish a facility such as this, which will be the first of its kind in the, in the country, um, it's taken you know, over, over a decade to get anywhere near this point. Um, as of next week, we start to see the, the plastic shrouds come off the building site, and um, we have every expectation that the service is going to open in September this year. I think this service will be transformational for a part of the community that doesn't probably often have a voice, certainly at this level.
because it's a part of the community that at the moment um, no one's attending to well enough. Um, there is no place to live for those for whom this services is targeted. Um, and we've sat with other community agencies, we've sat with Te Whatora, we've sat with um, New Zealand Police, uh, we've sat with Te Aro Health and said, where is the biggest need in this community right now? And this biggest, the biggest need we believe is in the community of people that are homeless and they're homeless because of alcohol addiction. And so our ability to respond to that is very needed. Um, and this facility will help in that regard. Will it meet all of the need? No, of course not. Uh, but when it opens in September with 18 ensuite bedrooms, we will create a place for people to be um, that will enable them to, to heal, um, enable them to reduce the chaos in their lives, and in, as a consequence, I guess, reduce the chaos in the community as well. This is a harm reduction service. This isn't about necessarily fixing people or making people sober, because that's not a reality in this circumstance. This is about helping people reduce the harm in their lives for themselves, for their whānau, and for the wider community. When we embarked on a building project um, about 18 months ago now, we didn't know it was going to end quite in this place. The initial um, refurbishment budget we had was a million dollars, and um, we had about a three-month build program. 18 months later, we're still building, and the price now sits at $6 million. That seems like an extraordinary change. Um, most of that relates to um, the ability or the requirement to establish foundations on the site uh, to meet the requirements of geotech engineers. Um, this building now has 12 piles that go down. The longest one is 20 metres into the ground. The shortest one is 13 and a half metres. We've had to reclad the building. We've had to re-roof the building. And because of our decision, and it was our decision mid-project, to ensuite the bedrooms, because that's about dignity and respect, then we've had, you know, we've put in 18 uh, bathrooms into the facility, and that's created some, some funding challenges. We note in our application that originally we applied for 350,000 for operational funding and 500,000 for capital. Uh, the 350, has, as per the recommendation, has been reduced on the reasonable expectation that MSD will, will fund the difference. Um, I'm sure that's Council's reasonable expectation. I'm not sure that's MSD's reasonable expectation, because we already have an ask of a million dollars of the Crown in terms of funding the, the annual cost of the service, um, which sits at close to one and a half million dollars to run. We also put an application up for 500,000 of capital funding contributing towards the additional $2 million we've got to find to build this building. Um, the suggestion in the paper is that 250,000 of that was going to be applied for through the annual plan. We didn't find a mechanism in that process to do that, and um, so we still sit here with, without the contribution from capital that we would have wanted to see from council. So um, the building um, is due to open in September. We're working hard to fund that fully, and if we can't fund it fully, it means that there's some debt loading on that building, and that will impact on the service that can be provided subsequent to September. I'm going to stop there, and I'm very happy to ask um, or entertain or accept any questions you might have. Te Marque, thank you very much. And before we take questions, I would personally like to offer our thanks on behalf of the committee and the wider council um, for the City Mission support during the recent fire event in Newtown. It is much appreciated by both the Council and our community, um, and you fellows did a really wonderful job, so thank you very, very much. Um, I have one question thus far from Councillor O'Neill. Tēnā koe, Māori. Thanks for coming in. Um, my pate is around what will be the impact of the difference between the amount requested and the amount recommended um, for the service? And I guess also trying to understand, um, yeah, my second question is around what kind of other operational funding is council historically given to the mission? Is this, do you see this as a reduction or um, a, new, a new commitment, a new project? Um, no, I don't see this as a reduction necessarily. I mean, council traditionally have put funding into the, what was the night shelter. This is not the night shelter, this is a different um, operation. For the last three years, Council has funded us operationally for this facility. We haven't been able to use this facility for that purpose, but we have provided those services from other facilities. So the net contribution of Council at this stage is capital of 250000 
the net effect of not having additional funding support and not being able to raise that funding support independently in the community is that um, somehow we have to we have to fund the debt on the building. Um, so the, the, as per the budget that's been submitted originally, the city um, the city mission had eighty thousand dollars a year to find. If you go with the recommended um, um, annual operational grant, then that's one hundred and eighty thousand for us to find. And if we have to find debt loading and debt um, uh, repayment on top of that, um, that's a significant uh, contribution the city mission will have to find if we're going to operate the service to its fullest capacity. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Called it. In that case, Tanakwe Murray, thank you for coming in. Um, much appreciated. That's the first for me. I haven't used the available time, so <laughs> I'll gift it back to you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I would just like to ask whether there is a Deepak Nair in the room. Not yet. All right. In that case, I would like us to take a brief adjournment whilst we have some morning tea. So let's adjourn there. We will be returning at uh, no later than 10.45. Kia ora.
Um, we're going to move to the second item on the agenda, namely 2.1 petition to increase funding for Wellington Free Ambulance. Now, as I understand it, the petitioner is not here to speak to the petition, so I would like to ask David Ensor and Michelle Walsh to please introduce the report on the petition. Kia ora koutou. Can I uh, introduce Michelle Walsh to you? She is our new um, funding team leader. She's got a beautiful new role within Connected Communities and we're very happy to um, have her here and in this team. Um, we will take the, the petition to increase funding for Wellington Free Ambulance as read um, and I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Any questions from members? Very well. <laughs> Um, will there be any debate? My apologies, we're going to move that first. Um, I would like to move, could I please have a seconder for this motion? Thank you, Councillor O'Neill. Um, sweet, I would like to put the motion, will there be any debate? Thank you very much, David and Michelle. <laughs> Councillor Matthews. Yeah, I just—I guess I just want to acknowledge the the petition um, and the good intent behind it, which you know all of us would support. Like all of the decisions that we have today, if almost you know without exception, if we could fund everybody more, and you know um, that we would do. And I, you know, the, it was good context to have that information about other funding that is going to Wellington Free Ambulance, and um, you know that we really this is a you know. It has to go into the to the long term plan kind of process and, and look at what we're doing over the longer term. So, just want to acknowledge um, that we all support the work of Wellington Free Ambulance and um, that we appreciate the advocacy on their behalf. Okay. Any further debate? All right. Very well. Um, I would like to um, reserve my right to reply there um, and. I would like to put the motion which has been moved and seconded to a vote. Those in favour, please press one. Against, press two. And that is carried unanimously. Um, righto. So at this point in time, um, yes. Uh, oh, yes. One moment, please. Um, so yeah, in accordance with Standing Order 19.1, um, I'm going to slightly alter the order of the agenda. Um, namely, we're going to move public excluded to now, and we will also have the CH Izzard um, bequest uh, just before actions tracking. Aside from that, everything will appear as it is in your uh, agendas. So um, without further ado, I'd like to... <coughs> One moment. Moving to public excluded. Um, so officers are recommending that the public be excluded from the next part of the proceedings. Um, I would like to move this motion. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Matthews. Um, will there be any debate? No. Nope. Um, I would like to now put the motion which has been moved and seconded to a vote. Please press one in favor and two against. Councillor Brown. Thank you. All right, I declare the motion carried unanimously. Um, from here, we're going to move into public excluded. Could I ask any remaining members of the public um, to please leave the room and for the live stream to be stopped?
Um, all right, sweet team. So from here, just so everyone's tracking um, how this is going to shake out, we're going to move into the main part of the meeting now. Um, namely, we're going to get through arts and culture, followed by the Living Wage Fund, followed by the Multi-Year Social and Rec Fund, followed by the General Social and Rec Fund. We're then going to move on to the Waste Minimization Fund, and then the Heritage Resilience and Region Report, and then the CH Izzard Bequest, and then we're going to finish off with Actions Tracking Forward Program. Everyone tracking on that, happy, Questions, problems, queries, victim impact statements, land claims. Roger, all right, yeah. let's do it. Um, yeah, just noting again that we are a quorum of four, so if you do need to leave the table for any reason, just let me know. Righto, so general business, arts and culture funds. Um, could I please welcome Andy Lowe and also Grace Hoite Kiora um, to introduce the report. O kānui te maki ka koutou, i kui mai koruma i rauranga tirama i ngā mātauaka, ngā paimaunga, ngā waiawa o te motu, tēnā tātou. He mahi tēnei ki ngā iwi o te rohi nei, tāna ki whānui, te ati awa ngāti toa. E, uh, kei te mahi, kei te mahi, kei te mahi. O tēnā tātou, uh, thank you so much for having us here today. Um, this is the third of three funding rounds of the 22-23 financial year, and the fund comprises 543,300 uh, 83 in total for the year, and it's made up of 248,383 uh, as a general arts and culture fund, 200,000 to support independent artists and groups who meet the criteria for this category, and 100,000 from operational budgets, which can also be allocated to professional performing arts practitioners. And this is to top up any high quality professional productions that have a confirmed pr uh, performance outcome in Wellington City. <laughs> Um, so the balance available now um, f at this end of the financial year is 144,062. Um, current fund, the current fund priorities and criteria are attached in the paper. Um, in addition to delivery to Ahutani, the focus of this round was on the areas where the number of applications and grants this year had been low. And this includes applications for mana whenua, Māori, Pacifica, and for projects working with visual arts, dance, and or supporting and celebrating Matariki. 53 applications were received in this round, requesting a total of 510,069, compared to 59 in the last fund funding round. Within these applications, the predominant genre was theatre, which accounted for 22 of the applications, followed by nine from music. The remaining applications were evenly spread across other genres, visual arts, dance, multidisciplinary arts, including toi Māori, raranga, rongoa practices, and community projects. Officers are recommending the grant subcommittee approve a total of 144,062 from the Arts and Culture Fund, independent artists and professional performing arts, and this being the total balance available at the moment. To be eligible for funding, applica applicants had to have projects that delivered to at least one of the Ahutini criteria. In this funding round, across all applications, 43 of the ap applications align strongly to the Ahutangata strand of Ahutini, which is about increasing the diversity of our communities and encouraging access, inclusiveness, and participation in arts and culture. 46 of the applications align strongly to the Ahumahi strand, which supports career pathways for artists. Five of the applications align strongly to the Aho Whenua strand, which is about our places, spaces and venues, its users and wider community. 22 applications aligned with the Aho Honunga strand, which is about partnerships with mana whenua or connections with mana whenua or Māori. And this is, a, is against five last time. So we are really, really, really pleased with this. Um, and a lot of work has gone uh, on in this space. So um, huge mahi to Grace and all of the team in this, in this work, uh, working with Matau Haroni on this. On this. Um, just so you know, last night there was one withdrawal, uh, which is the Connor Turnbull one, um, which we've replaced by emerging, an emerging conductor for the Wellington Symphonic um, Band, if that's okay, ha have a look there, um, and you'll see that there's going to be connections and crossovers with the living wage um, ap applications that Mark will talk to soon as well. Um, and we will be reviewing the multi-year funded arts organisations next financial year too, to have a look at how we do those. So, nō reira, uh, he mahi nui ka koutou katoa, uh, he pātai tēnā, uh, kia koutou, tēnā tātou. Choice, karerira ki mihi kia kōrua. Um, will there be any questions? There's one from me. Anybody else? One from Councillor O'Neill. So, my question, so kia ora for that. Um, my question is the applications that you describe as aligning with the uh, Aho Honunga target, do you feel like those represent genuine 
engagements with mana fenol? What's the, what's the quality like there? Do you feel like there's a real se se seeking of partnership there? Uh, or are they taking a box to get some funding? Pai to all partai, um, Council Nik Niko Winera. Um, I'm going to hand that over to Grace because I think we've got some good good. Um, uh, nā mihi rangi tera ma. Uh, yes, I think they're actually very high quality uh, projects and in fact extremely high quality. Um, and it's pleasing there's one or two that have got strong connections with mana whenua and will require mana whenua involvement. Um, but the Kaumau Festival takes quite a chunk of that, and, um, and along with, uh, um, and that's a high caliber um, uh, festival, very much around performing arts, but also has now added a new visual element to it as well as um, it's a live and digital festival. Sure, oh. mm. Kapai, thank you for that. Um, a question from Councillor O'Neill. Kia ora, my part is around ahohono as well. Um, and at Grants Committee, we've often struggled to find applications that engage with Māori and mana whenua in Wellington. So I was just wondering between now and the last time that we went out, what extra things did you do? How did, how did you get there? It's very exciting. I have an extensive network within the Māori sector. Um, and so it's just like, you just kind of got to go up there and dust them down and say, come on, wake up. Um, council's here to support you, but we can't do anything unless you come to the table. And, and they have, they have, so which is a positive, but it's, it's a matter of keeping on to them. Awesome. We're not great on the application part. <laughs> All right then, tēnā kōrua, thank you for that. Um, no more questions before we move on to debate? No worries, thank you very much. Kia ora. Oh, my God. All right then, could I please ask for a mover for the motion? Councillor O'Neill. And a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Matthews. Um, will there be any debates? Please. Kia ora, just very briefly, um, this is such an amazing fund and it's so cool to see lots of different projects here. In particular, I'm super excited about the Kiamo Festival. And um, Nico Winera and I sit on a Creative Communities panel um, with a few other members and we had so many applications and it's great to see some of the ones that didn't get funding there now funded through uh, this spot, including the Strathmore Park Stitching Lounge, which is really awesome. But yeah, just wanted to acknowledge those. Fantastic. Will there be any further debate? Councillor Matthews, no, and no right reply. Kapai. All right, in that case, I would like to now put the motion which has been moved and seconded to a vote. Press one if yay, press two if nay. And that has been carried unanimously. Kia ora, councillors. Righto. Cracking straight on. <clears throat> I would now like to move to the Living Wage Fund for Events, um, the March 23 funding round. Um, could I please welcome Mark Farrar to introduce the report? Mark Farrar, Arahatsu. Kira uh, So this is the living wage for non-council events fund that we have. This is year two of a three-year program of funding. Um, and as councillors will recall, this fund, the majority of this fund this year has been tied up in multi-year funding arrangements around lots of arts and culture groups uh, who then work with organisations to put on events through, for example, a fringe festival and different festivals. So this leaves some $78,000 to allocate. This is the second tranche of funding we're allocating this year through these recommendations. Um, our approach really is to try and lift the pay of people involved in events and arts projects to the living wage, uh, noting that the living wage will rise to $26 on the 1st of September this year. Um, there's a mix of applications in here, some of which just apply to us for all the personnel costs. Um, and there are others that make a good case for the living wage support. So the recommendations are a mix of those where they've shown very clearly 
which people wouldn't get paid and what what they're applying for and a mix of ones were were applying a sort of standard 200 hours of living wage to fund particular roles in those organizations working closely with um, Andy Grace and Stephen in the events team so these recommendations are for nine projects allocating the whole of the rest of the funding for this year there is quite a bit of overlap um, and officers have done quite a bit of work with um, you know with the arts team and everybody there are opportunities for some of these to come back again in the next funding round because their events don't happen until later in the year. Um, so that's all I was going to say really. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, will there be any questions before we move on to debate? No, in that case, thank you very much, Mark. So, will there be a mover for this motion? Yes, Councillor Matthews, will there be a seconder? And Councillor Brown, thank you, Councillor Brown. Thank you for your service. Um, will there be any debate? Just very briefly, um, I want to thank the team for their work on this. Um, obviously, this is, you know, this is my baby, this fund, from last term, and it's always very exciting when the applications come to committee. Um, I just want to acknowledge the um, the jump in the living wage and, you know, that that means, you know, to, for all of the organisations that have an aspiration to pay it, um, you know, it is, a, it is a challenging time. And, you know, I, I, I think that um, us being able to... Uh, and that jump has become because people have a, a high cost of living increase. And so it's all the more important that we continue to do this work. And I just also want to acknowledge, I think the crossover is actually a really positive and healthy thing because I think it means that the importance of paying a living wage in the arts sector is becoming more widely sort of socialised. And, and um, so I think that's, you know, an, an excellent kind of result from this fund also. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Matthews. Will there be any further debate? Councillor Brown, and no right of reply. All right, in that case, I would like to put the motion which has been moved and seconded to a vote. Aida Kwamanna, that has been carried unanimously. Choice. Let us move on <coughs> to item 3.3, the multi-year funding of the Social and Recreation Fund, I would like to welcome David Ensor to introduce the report. No matter my. Good Arnold. Um, very happy to uh, introduce the multi-year funding uh, report. Just a couple of comments. Um, and then very happy to answer any questions. Primarily, what you're considering um, at the multi-year applications for the youth organisations that council has provided funding to uh, for a number of years, as well as um, a couple of others, um, including Community Law, which is the Tenant Advocacy Support Service, um, Vincent, who, who spoke to you earlier, and the Sustainability Trust Plus Time Bank. The, the Social and Rec Fund um, is a, a wonderful fund. It provides... Um, you know, a, a huge level of flexibility um, to you and to, to us to support the initiatives that are important to the council. Um, but it has, over time, become, um, I think, somewhat confused and um, the multi-year commitments that we make have made it very difficult to um, work with you around how we can kind of best utilise the fund. Um, so I just wanted to signal um, through through this that um, most of our recommendations are for one year or two years rather than the standard three years that we um, that we use for multi-year contracts, and that is to attempt to line up all of the multi-year funding that we have through to um, mid-2025, and it's our intention to um, review the fund and work with you on that um, over the next kind of 12 months or so um, to make sure that the fund is delivering the outcomes um, that you know you, you're expecting it to. Also, I wanted to highlight um, two organisations that we've recommended funding for one year rather than the, the two. Um, that is Vincent's as well as Time Bank, who you spoke, who we heard from earlier today. 
The logic around that um, is that both organisations have been through significant change um, very recently, and the one-year time frame provides an opportunity for us to work with them very closely during that period of time um, to understand kind of the impact of those changes and the um, outcomes that are delivered against the, the contracts that we enter into. Outside of that, very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, David. Um, will there be any questions? Uh, members, following the questions, thank you, Councillor Brown. Following the questions, we are going to take a brief five minute adjournment to discuss a procedural matter. Um, I'd also just like to encourage you to use that time to use the bathroom if you can. Um, and we'll also note that lunch will be provided no later than uh, 12 30. Uh, Councillor Brown, a question. Just as it's just a sort of random uh, looking at the facts here, but the, a couple of, quite a few of them have actually had reasonably material cuts in their allocations. And I'm just wondering if you could just talk me through uh, the Wellington Boys and Girls Institute uh, funding cut, the 25 odd grand that they're getting, which is down from what they've got in the past. What, you know, why did you decide to do that? Yes, sorry, one moment. I have some notes about that one. Um, <laughs> the, there was a, an increase in funding made available to us over the last couple of years around COVID and the COVID recovery. Um, and that, I might need Mark to, to help me with the detail. He's been around here a little bit longer than I have, but that funding um, has ended. So we're working on, on the level of funding that we have available. Around BGI specifically, though. Um, Welcome, Mark. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Do you want to explain that? I, I think that the recommendations for the, I mean, there's a group of youth development organisations in there, and um, in doing assessments, our team looked at what they were proposing to do. So the one for the Boys and Girls Institute was to fund specific programmes that they applied for um, in the proposal. Um, uh, of course, the challenge we have in this fund is that, you know, the more you put into this fund, it means the less there is for those smaller grants throughout the year. So um, in the last round of contract funding, because we had all that extra money through the COVID recovery fund, I think we had a million and a half over two years, um, that meant that we kind of increased funding for organisations. So we're trying to do a little bit of reset and a little bit of funding specific programmes that really play to the children and young people's strategy outcomes. So for BGI, I think that's the challenge for change, you know, particular programmes that they operate. Um, I, I'm very confident that BGI will um, be able to run the programmes they do. They're, they're financially quite um, stable, I would yeah. think, as an organisation. The, the level of funding recommended is, is reasonably consistent with what we have provided right back to 2014 um, with that increase, recent increase over the last couple of years. All right. Um, if there are no more questions, oh, well, oh sorry, my apologies, Councillor O'Neill. Um, same question, but for Vincent. So, um, it says in the report, annual funding is about ninety thousand, but they said in their speech they're used to being funded about one hundred and seven thousand. I just wanted to check if my memory serves. And they've requested 150. Yeah, please. I mean, for a long time, Vincent's funding was around the 60k mark, and then when Timatapihi Central Library closed down, we were able to increase their funding to extend their opening hours. That's I'd have to, I'd have to just, you'd have to give me a moment just to check on the okay. figures, really. But last year, their funding was at about 90. Um, it's, it's the same funding that they received last year, the same level of funding is my understanding, yeah. Yeah. Um, although it is it is less than they requested. Yeah. Okay, if, yeah, if there's any further information required, the member can pursue that in the adjournment. Um, sweet. Um, otherwise, everybody happy? All right, so the meeting will now be adjourned. We're going to reconvene at 11.30. Correction, 11.35. <laughs>
um, and we will resume. So uh, thank you for those, for fielding those questions, David. Um, and also thank you for those of you who put your heads together for that brief little hui uh, during the adjournment, much appreciated. And thank you everybody else for being so patient. Um, will there be a mover for this motion? I will move the emo I will move the motion, and Councillor Brown will second. Will there be any debate, Councillor Matthews? Um, I would like to move an amendment. Yes. Um, if we could scroll down so we could have a look at the words, uh, and that will be obviously seconded by Councillor O'Neill. <laughs> so we're using all of the cast yes. in this. <laughs> uh, so. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I just, um, and I'd like to thank officers um, uh, Alison and, and Kim and others for, for working on us to come to come to a wording I think that everybody could live with. Um, and I guess just to acknowledge um, that we are seeking ways to further our support for the Te, te Pamaru project um, and um, that uh, we, you know, and looking at mechanisms that we can can do so, and this mechanism has already been used in a somewhat different form to support this project, and so um, essentially to look at whether we can adjust the criteria for the Environmental and Accessibility Performance Fund, and just noting that this committee, you know, would like to further support uh, Te Pā Maru. So, yeah, thank you. Um, would the seconder like to speak? Yes, please. Um, just to talk and support, and I want to thank Councillor Matthews for um, bringing this issue and, and really trying to find a resolution today. Um, this process means that it will go to the Koro Martinitani Social, Cultural and Economic Committee, um, and uh, that's my committee. So um, we will... <laughs> we, um, be able to receive further advice on it as well and it's not lost on me the sort of important role of Wellington City Mission over the last few weeks and how important it is that council continues to maintain consistent support for the services of Te Pā Maru as well. Um, this is the first of its kind harm reduction project and I think we should be able to open the space um, without taking out debt against it. Um, yeah, I recommend to the committee that, that you all support this amendment. All right, will there be any further debate? Or right of reply? In that case, let us resolve this amendment. Um, so let us put it to a vote. Press one for yay and two for nay. Kwamana, congratulations. That has been carried unanimously. So we will now return to the substantive. Um, I would like to reserve my right to speak. Um, would the seconder like to speak? Science is consent, Roger. Um, in that case, we are going to put that motion which has been moved and seconded. And that has been carried. All right, thank you for that, everybody. Um, that concludes the multi-year funding item. We are now going to move on to the General Social and Recreation Fund. Uh, please welcome David Ensor, no my heart my um, to introduce the report. Kia ora anō. Uh, very happy to introduce this report to you um, this morning, still the morning. Um, in, this, in this round, we had um, funding of $120,000 available for uh, consideration. We received um, applications from 30 organisations, total funding request of $341,000. Um, so the team and I went through a, a reasonably robust process to assess the applications we received and to identify uh, the most appropriate organisations to receive the limited funding that we had available. And we've recommended funding for um, a variety of initiatives um, for 18, 18 different organisations. 
In addition to that, uh, we were able to identify four applications who had requested funding through the um, Social and Rec Fund, and we were able to identify um, funding available to us during through our OPEX budget. So in addition to the um, $120,000 that we're asking you to um, approve today, um, we're finding further funding for four um, initiatives, a um, Matariki Kai celebration with DCM, um, the support that the Island Bay Presbyterian Church provide to um, council residents in um, Berenpore, uh, funding for the Māori wardens as well as for the, the soup kitchen, and, and we will fund that through um, operating budgets. Very happy to comment on um, is our recommendation to not provide funding to Everybody Eats um, during this round. Um, that is for a range of, of reasons, in, including the um, commitments already made through the fund, um, but we will will be supporting um, Everybody Eats to submit an application uh, for funding through the Betty Campbell Fund, um, as well as a, an application in the next round of funding coming up in October to answer any questions. All right, thank you very much for that. Me nā he pātai a koutou korero mai. Kāra he pātai. He pātai tāku, I have one, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so could you just explain to us a little bit more about how that process with helping everybody eats to apply for the Betty Cable Fund will go? Could you just explain a bit to the committee what that will look like? Yes, definitely. We will um, meet with them very shortly. We've, we've spoken to them already, and we will um, work with them to to structure an application in a way that um, makes it very clear um, how they meet the criteria of the fund, um, and then that will allow us to uh, better recommend to you to provide that funding. Fantastic, and is there a time frame on when that might be granted if it is to be granted? Uh, yes, there is, definitely. So the Betty Campbell Accommodation Assistance Fund is delegated to officers, and we usually open it in mid-June for decisions in early July, so it'll be fairly quick. All right, kei te pai. He pātai anō. Kaore. Nah, sweet as. All right, thank you very much, David. So, um, I would like to move this, and will there be a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Matthews. Um, Will there be any debates? I would like to debate, actually. Um, I would just like to thank officers for this report, um, and I would also just like to really note that there are always fantastic initiatives that are going on within the city that might not perfectly align to our fund, and just note that that does not diminish their worthiness by any means whatsoever, um, and that you know the City Council is always committed to finding alternate ways that we can support awesome projects in our community. Um, with that, I would like to now put the motion which has been moved and seconded. Kapai, that has been carried unanimously. Righto, cracking straight on. Sweet, from here we're going to be proceeding to item 3.6 on your original sheet, um, which will be the Waste Minimisation Seed Fund. Uh, please welcome Jenny Elliott, in the absence of Chris Matthews, to introduce the report. Kia ora. Kia ora. Um, so just to see Chris's here as well and can step in if needed, but <laughs> but I'm going to introduce this paper. Um, so yeah, this is the Waste Minimisation Seed Fund Organics Diversion for 2023. So just um, to explain, the money for this fund comes from the levy paid on waste, which is sitting at $30 a tonne at the moment. Um, the focus for this fund really is on actual diversion of organic waste from landfill. Uh, we have an annual allocation of 100,000 plus any underspend from the year before. So this year we have $105,175 to allocate. Um, this is the second year of three years for this fund. Um, so this year we received five full applications. The request totaled just over 356,000. Um, the projects were weighed up against the fund criteria. So first of all, noting that it is a seed fund, we had some really good applications. But the intention for this really is to kickstart a new project or to significantly expand the scope of something which is existing. Um, we look at the waste hierarchy, so favouring reduction and reuse over recycling. 
um, and considering the potential for the diversion tonnages that would come out of the projects. So officers are recommending the allocation of funding for two projects. So that's JW Framing, which is a wholesale rescued timber project, so targeting demolition timber. And that's $63,714. And the other one is Organic Wealth out of the BIN project, which is basically working with local businesses to target commercial food waste. Um, so other than that, I'll just take the report as read and happy to answer any questions. Choice, any questions? Happy as? All right, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, will there be a move for the motion? Councillor O'Neill, thank you. Will there be a seconder? I will second. You know what? Just get straight in there. Um, will there be any debate? Called it. I will also reserve my right. In that case, I would like to now put the motion which has been moved and seconded. And that has been carried unanimously. Fantastic. Let's move on. Okay, we now come to item 3.7, the Heritage Resilience and Regeneration Fund 22-23 report. Um, no my Mark Lindsay and co uh, to introduce the report. Maura Nikoto, uh, this is my colleague Noel Lizzie from the Cultural Heritage Team. Mark Lindsay, I'm the Manager of Cultural right. Heritage for the Council. Um, just a couple of introductory remarks about this paper. It is a noting paper for the Council. Um, it seeks to do two things, is to present the, um, what is the first round of funding for the Heritage Resilience and Regeneration Fund. This fund is, uh, uh, replaces the long-standing Built Heritage Incentive uh, fund. Uh, the second purpose of the paper is to set out for the Council's information the long-term strategy for how this fund will uh, evolve over time. Uh, broadly, the intention of the fund is to target uh, funding to earthquake-prone uh, resilience buildings and high priorities within Council's resilience program for those buildings. Uh, it's to align this funding where possible with other investments that are occurring within the city, such as Let's Get Wellington Moving, uh, and also where Council is investing in urban regeneration and place-making um, initiatives. So all of the um, uh, funding earthquake-prone building funding recommendations in the paper uh, address the highest priorities in the resilience program. There are some 600 earthquake-prone heritage bu uh, buildings in total in the city, about 140 of those are uh, heritage buildings. This is the only funding that goes into directly from council into um, supporting those building owners. Uh, there is a peak of uh, the Building Act earthquake-prone um, notices expiring, which require the building owners to strengthen their buildings uh, in 2007-2008. So this is the only direct funding from Council that goes into any of those 600 uh, buildings. Um, uh, the fund is means-tested. Uh, the intention, as uh, which is carried over from the previous Built Heritage Incentive Fund, is that uh, these the funding goes to buildings that would not be strengthened um, otherwise without the council uh, without the council's support. Um, so, uh, as I say, they, they are mean test, means tested. Most of these buildings are um, commercial buildings or large scale residential buildings uh, or buildings that um, whose purpose is predominantly uh, hospitality, uh, retail, or um, other public purposes. What we see is one of the benefits of the fund is that we have um, uh, support through the refurbishment and regeneration of these heritage buildings as part of um, uh, creating uh, viable economic propositions within the city as part of the urban regeneration um, interests of the city. Not only are they safer buildings, but they become much stronger. Um, uh, tenantable and commercial propositions. Uh, they're highly desirable accommodation, retail or hospitality uh, venues. Um, and there is a multiplier effect when we get a number of these buildings in, in, in the joined up and aligned fashion that the strategy is attempting to do. Uh, the multiplier effect is around um, other neighbourhoods, um, uh, other buildings in the neighbourhood um, being regenerated, being supported, attracting uh, visitation and commercial activity. Um, as well as, of course, retaining some of Wellington's most important um, listed heritage buildings. Um, 
Uh, so I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you for that. Will there be any questions? Councillor O'Neill. Thank you. When I've looked at the council's heritage strategy in the past, or we've gone through a district plan changes, um, there seems to be quite a significant inequity between preserving um, colonial heritage and versus heritage of that are important place and heritage to mana whenua and Māori and Wellington. Mm -hmm. How does the change in this fund seek to address some of those things, or are we are we looking to rebalance it in any way? Or we, we've certainly looked at that as as an issue. So um, the district plan. Um, it lists uh, heritage uh, buildings um, uh, for protection, but also lists sites of significance to Māori within a different section of, of, uh, uh, of the plan. They tend to be more land-based rather than buildings as such. So this fund, uh, we have scrutinised the city, as it were, for eligible buildings which would have a, a mana whenua interest or um, uh, would, would represent... Um, more of that balance that you're talking about. But because of the nature of the buildings within the city, th uh, there are none for a built heritage fund uh, that, that, that would address that particular issue. So um, it's something that we have addressed as a, um, uh, explicitly in the past. Cool. Kia ora. Thanks. Satisfied, Councillor Neil? Choice. Um, will there be any more questions? Kaori. Sweet as. In that case, thank you very much for that, Kaurua. Um Let's move on to moving the motion. Kia ora. So I would like to move. Um, will there be a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Brown. Um, will there be any debate? I'll reserve my right. Called it. Choice. In that case, I would like to now put the motion which has been moved and seconded. And that has been carried. Thank you very much. Thank everyone. you. All right. I would now like to move on to item 3.5. This is our last kind of gutsy item, so we'll um, crack through it pretty quickly. This is the CH Izzard Bequest Recommendations 23. Um, could we please welcome... Oh, and Mark, please welcome uh, Mark to introduce the report. Um, kia ora koutou. Um, just very briefly, I take the paper as read. This is a bequest that goes back to the 1930s. Um, we're asking you to, to approve our recommendations to the trustees, um, and the purpose of the fund is around social disadvantage and community benefit. So our team have worked through the applications that have come through. Um, there's $20,000 for them to allocate, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Will there be any questions? All right then. Um, thank you very much for that, Mark. Uh, I would also like to move this. Will there be a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Matthews. Um, I would actually just like to say that I think this is a very beautiful little bequest. Um, for those of you who may not know, I did a bit of reading and this was implemented by a gentleman who served on the City Council um, previously and then went on to become a Member of Parliament and he donated quite a substantial sum back in those days in the 20s, I think it was 25, or maybe the 30s, um, to be managed by a bunch of lawyers to invest, and the dividends of that, uh, he stipulated to go back to parts of the community in need. So I'm actually quite stoked to be moving this one. Um, will there be any further debate? No worries, in that case, I would like to now put the motion. Alrighty, and bang on 1,200, we have finished. Okay, so we're just gonna move on to the actions tracking and forward program, and then we are due for some Kai, I reckon. So, for the actions tracking, please welcome Kim Fell to introduce the report. Kia ora. <coughs> Kia ora, Chia. Um, look, I think we might just take this paper as read, if that's okay. We're happy to answer any questions. Will there be any questions? Kia ora. Um, I would like to move, would someone like to second? Okay, all right, Dem services can choose anyone else. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> this, this, yeah, this will be Councillor O'Neill. <laughs> all right, and will there be any debate? 
I reserve my right. No, in that case, I'd like to now put second of. And that has been carried. Thank you for that. And finally, we'll move on to the forward program. Um, please welcome once again. Thank you. Um, look, this paper here, we've got our forward program really for October, the 4th of October, and the next one is, I think, December the 6th. So, um, yeah, we'll take the paper as read and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Will there be any questions? I actually do have a question. Yeah. Is, did you say that's the next meeting of the... Uh, it's on the 4th of October. On the 4th of October. Yeah, 4th of October. Gosh. Um, all right. So yes. Councillor Brown. Please use your microphone. What's it actually showing? Sorry, I've just obviously... A bit they, are the, they are the next papers that are coming up to the council meeting on the... Um, on, or to this subcommittee on the 4th of October. So there's the Arts and Culture Fund. Oh, I'm looking at my looking at the wrong one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's why <laughs> I couldn't work it out. We've okay. already done that one. <laughs> 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 Sorry, okay, I'll take it. Yeah, oh, good. Good. <laughs> Jolly good. Thank you. All right then. Um, in that case, um, cool. Uh, I would also like to move this. Will there be a seconder? Yeah, I'll do this. Thank you, Councillor Matthews. Um, I will reserve my right to debate. There will be no further debates. Um, and I would like to now put the motion. Aira Kua Manna, that has been carried. Roger, that was everything, wasn't it? In that case, thank you very much um, for that sharp and snappy hui. Finished before 12.30, how about that? Um, sweet, from here, I would like to close us with a karakia. Um, just note that I will stand, please note with us. Um, in the here, in the here, in the here, the Tapinui, Kiawatia, Kiamama, the Nako, the Tinana, the Wairu, the Artangata, Koyara, Rungu, Fakairia, Kiringa, Kiawatia, Kiawatia, Aira, Kiawatia, Kiora.